Now let's talk specifically about visualizing data that you would generate from the HiCSE. So to be more precise about what kind of data comes out of a HiCSE experiment, uh, basically once you sequence your chimeric reads and you align uh, the ends of those chimeric reads uh, back to the original genome to figure out which uh, two loci were interacting to produce the chimeric read, basically what you can do is for every chimeric read that you sequence, you can then basically figure out which pair of uh, loci your reads came from. And you can basically create, again, this table that I'm showing you here represented by this heat map, where the i throw and jth column, uh, the value stored at the i throw and jth column basically correspond to the number of reads that you sequenced, um, which basically represent an interaction between loci i locus i and locus j. And so essentially this table represents a, a matrix of counts O, where yeah, OIG represents the number of reads uh, for which one end mapped to uh, locus i and one read mapped to locus j. And so again, the diagonal on this, on this heat map or this O matrix basically tells you about um, the local interactions, which are likely in large part nonspecific. Uh, between adjacent loci in the genome. And so looking at the raw kind of counts out of a high C experiment isn't, is typically uh, not that common because, again, a lot of the interactions that you see in the raw uh, count matrix O are expected. So as I mentioned before, adjacent positions on the genome, for example, are expected to interact very frequently uh, because um, just because they're close uh, on the linear chromosome. And so obviously they're going to be found in close proximity uh, in 3D space frequently. And so what's a little bit more common is to do some kind of uh, what's called a normalization. And so what this means is that you can basically compute, um, basically there is just a lot of software that computes what you might call an expected read count. So given the depth of your sequencing, um, there's a lot of models out there which can basically tell you, okay, well, given that I expect that two positions that are close in linear uh, in linear genome, genome space to be more frequently interacting than pairs of loci that are far away on the linear chromosome, then I can compute what I basically expect in terms of the number of reads mapping to uh, each pair of loci just based on their linear proximity, for example. And then I can take my observed counts, I can divide out by my expected counts, and I can basically get rid of, for example, the large signal on the diagonal, which is um, something that, which is signal that I already expect, and so wouldn't be really surprising. And so the goal of high C obviously is to tell you about interactions that you didn't expect ahead of time. Um, and so that's kind of the purpose of this normalization step. And so this, uh, what I'll call a ratio matrix that we calculated on the left slide by, or in the last slide by dividing the observed counts by the expected, um, is typically uh, not actually directly used per se. So if you see the R matrix, uh, which is redrawn on the left, you'll see that where red means uh, more expected in more interactions than you expect by chance and blue means less. You can see that the difference between the red and the blue is, is not too striking. And so what people oftentimes do is that they take this R matrix, this racial matrix, and they compute a correlation matrix. And so the, in the correlation matrix, the correlation matrix is the same size as the racial matrix. So there's still uh, one row and one column for every uh, locus on your chromosome of interest. And so basically the, the difference is that uh, the value that you see at row I and column J of the correlation matrix is calculated by looking at the row I and row J of the ratio matrix and just looking across all loci and just asking how correlated are the ratio of the counts of row I and row J on the left. And that gives you the, uh, the value you see in the i row and j column of the correlation matrix. And so the point here is that the correlation is going to be high when loci i and j uh, share a lot of neighbors in the ratio matrix. And so basically the idea is that if two loci are close by in 3D space in the nucleus, uh, 
then uh, they will tend to interact. And if they tend to interact, then that means that the other loci that they're each individually interacting with will also tend to be shared because that just means everybody's in the same region of 3D space in the nucleus. And so you can see immediately just at a high level that the correlation matrix is, uh, it has a lot more kind of uh, clear distinctions between the red and the blue regions uh, of the map. And more importantly, if you kind of look at the whole at the table as a whole, you can kind of see a banding pattern. So if you look across the rows, for example, from top to bottom, you can see that there's basically two general classes of rows um, and they kind of alternate between each other. And so you can, yeah, if you just kind of scan from the top row down to the bottom row, you can kind of see that there's like a flipping of, of different types of rows uh, as you go from top to bottom. And so it turns out that what that flipping of uh, you know different row types is what it represents is uh, is basically the division of loci into A and B compartments. And so that was one of the big findings of Hi-C um, when it was first invented. And so the idea here is that basically uh, you can see blocks of row blocks of rows that are close to each other tend to form. Um, tend to look similar. And so tads basically are represented by the rectangles uh, that you see in this diagram. And where you see swap switching between, for example, a red, red block in one set of rows and a blue block underneath it is basically, uh, are basically boundaries between two different tads. And so the reason why you see this kind of banding pattern is you go from the top to the bottom row is that uh, basically the rows that look the same in this table tend to correspond to one compartment, say the A compartment, and the other set of rows tend to correspond to the B compartments. And so we'll discuss this more on the next slide, but basically, you, again, your AB compartments tend to correspond to regions of the genome that uh, are either in transcriptionally active or A compartments, or they're in transcriptionally inactive or B compartments. Um, and so one of the ways in which people identify which compartment your, you know, a given uh, locus in the genome sits in is through running a statistical analysis called principal components analysis. And so we'll discuss more in the human genetics lecture what exactly principal components analysis is. But basically, um, for the purposes of this lecture, the only thing that you really need to know is that principal components analysis calculates different principal components, and so PC stands for principal components, and PC1 is kind of the most important one. And so if you look at PC1, PC1 basically um, assigns a value, either negative or positive, to every row in this correlation matrix. And so if you look at the PC1 values as you scan from top to bottom, you again also kind of see a banding pattern where you'll see a whole bunch of rows point in one direction, and then all of a sudden there'll be like a very um, pronounced switch to the other side and back to the other side to negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, and so on. And if you look closely at the rows of the correlation matrix, where the PC1 values switch from negative, and po negative to positive and back basically correspond to where the banding pattern switches as well. And so the point here is that when you use this principal components analysis and you calculate this PC1, basically where the values switch from positive to negative and back basically indicate to you where the uh, where a potential boundary in a tad is and all of the rows that correspond to negative pc values correspond to you know one of the ab compartments and all of the values all of the rows that get a you know let's say a positive value of pc1 basically correspond to uh, loci in the other compartment And so something that we haven't really touched on yet, uh, but what is important is, is the bias that's inherent in, in these assays. And so for example, in the high C protocol, which I'm showing you here on the top right, again, uh, one of the most important aspects of that protocol is the enzyme digestion. Um, but one of the issues with enzyme digestion is that the efficiency of that digestion uh, kind of depends on the local GC content of the sequence around the cut site. 
And so here, for example, uh, for each of these graphs, I'm showing you the efficiency, the relative efficiency of two different restriction enzymes as a function of the GC content of either locus. So the y-axis is the GC content of one locus, and the x-axis is the GC content of the other locus. And you can see that even for the same cut site, um, the local GC content can, can vary and affect the efficiency of, of the cutting uh, along with it. And so these, um, these bias patterns can look different for different enzymes. Uh, so the point here is that is that basically um, local sequence content and local sequence structure has a substantial influence on the efficiency of, of these restriction enzymes. And so another area where efficiency comes into play is in the ligation uh, step of the assaying. And so recall that after you, in high C, for example, um, after you cut the uh, chromatin with your restriction enzyme and you add your biotin to the ends, uh, you need to ligate, um, ligate the ends so that chimeric reads form. And so part of the problem you have when you, uh, when you ligate your uh, different fragments to form chimeric reads is that if, for example, the fragments from the two different loci are about the same length, then uh, ligation is fairly easy to happen. But if one fragment is significantly shorter than the other, uh, then you run into problems in that it may not be sterically possible for the uh, ligation to happen, or there might be uh, excessive like looping or problems like that, uh, which prevent uh, ligation from successfully happening. And so shown on the right again is basically the uh, ligation efficiency. Uh, when you make uh, cuts using different enzymes and you consider the effect of, for example, length of one fragment versus the other. And so again here, you can see that uh, two different restriction enzymes can have different biases in terms of uh, which fragment lengths that they prefer uh, in order for ligation to happen successfully.